okay to start, Max? Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the final installment of general reactivity and um, probably the most important from the standpoint of substitution in the class of heterocycle that you will most often be substituting, uh, that is pyridine. So we talked a little bit about electrophilic aromatic substitution on a pyridine. And in general, that requires some sort of electron donating substituent, obviously, to uh, quell the nitrobenzene-like activity of pyridine and make it more sort of active towards that kind of attack. But in general, pyridines are going to be less electron rich. You're usually not going to have amines on them or hydroxyls on them. And often you're going to have uh, nothing at all. And in those cases, you're going to need to think about things like deprotonation. So nucleophilic attack on hydrogen. And so most of this lecture is going to cover a lot of the dazzling things that can happen when one starts to try to deprotonate CH atoms on a pyridine. Okay, so let's talk about this thrombin inhibitor uh, reported in this Merck paper back in 2004. And to start us off, uh, Sung Han will give us the three building blocks or the three general disconnections that might be applicable to make a compound like this. So there's three things hiding in here, Sung Han. Can you give us a couple of the building blocks? I think first I will cut the amide bond. Cut the amide bond is a phenomenal idea. Uh, and that's going to give us um, a fragment here with a, let's say an acid or an ester. What's another bond that might be strategic in order to break? Uh, the other, I guess I will cut the SP3 carbon nitrogen bond. Yeah, um, you could imagine cutting either here or you could also imagine cutting here. These folks chose the, the latter because it's easier to do a SNAR reaction into an intermediate like that. So first let's get our amine fragment. And then let's take a look at our prazinone fragment. And you can imagine when you treat this with PLCL3, or you could even use something like Pybrop, you can imagine it's easy then to do a selective displacement on that halide or activated oxygen atom because this one is next to a kind of pyrrole-like nitrogen and this one is next to a pyridine-like nitrogen and so you should get nice SNAR selectivity as we talked about last time. So now you'll notice uh, and recall that this class is divided into medicinal process and radiochemists. Uh, we'll get to the radiochemists a lot eventually but for now we'll start off with a cage match between Ellie and Carter. So Ellie is a medicinal chemist and Carter is a process chemist. And um, if we need to make A, uh, what might be a good precursor to A? Uh, either Ellie or Carter can start us off in thinking about- uh, Oh, sorry, the N oxide. Oh, Ellie is a real medicinal chemist. And what else do I put on the ring? Um, well, you still have your your fluorine from before, and then uh, you could add like um, oh, uh, you could add some like maybe TNS TMS cyanide, and then do like a nitrile reduction. That sounds brilliant. Many doge coming your way, Ellie, thank you. So Carter, uh, you're a process chemist. So Ellie has now given you this uh, background that she's used to make a million analogs, um, but you notice there's something wrong with that sequence. What, what are the, some of the things as a process chemist you may say, mm, not really liking that route that you use in MedChem? Um, I suppose you could have some minor regioselectivity issues.
So for a medicinal chemist, remember the only the only yield that matters is enough for biological testing. Okay, it's like get that in your mindset and the realization that um, yields and mixtures, as long as they can be separated, not a problem. You just want to get to your biological question as fast as you can. It's not about elegance. It's about modularity and about getting the product quickly. That's what will get you promoted in the medicinal chemistry department. But in the process chemistry department, you have to pay attention to the weeds. And the little needle in the haystack here is that 3% regioisomer, and that's a big problem. So we can't do that. Anything else, Carter, that you don't like about that route? Uh, I guess maybe large scale cyanide. Yeah, big problem on large scale. We wanna probably avoid that. And every time you make an N oxide, you're gonna to wanna to evaluate it by uh, DSC to make sure it's not an energetic and it doesn't have a, you know, some sort of explosive event at a certain temperature. And so you'll need to pay attention to it. N oxides are used all the time in process chemistry. It's not like you need to avoid them. You just need to be cognizant of the fact that there may be an issue you need to evaluate. So pretty much all three of these things make it a non-starter. So Carter, any ideas of where we're gonna to start to make this compound? Let's assume we can still commit ourselves to the fluorocyanide as a good precursor. But from a process standpoint, what might be a better way to do this that avoids an oxide and avoids TMS cyanide or any cyanide source whatsoever? Um, I suppose we could leverage the fluorine as a, a directing group and deprotonate alpha to the purity nitrogen. And then quench it with? Um, I suppose you could do with CO2 and then reductive uh, emanation. Brilliant order, that was excellent. So we're gonna take advantage of the fact that we can do a CHD protonation. We can accomplish that with high regiochemistry. We'll explain why in just a moment. We can quench that with CO2. And then although it's more steps in the medicinal chemistry route, they're all crystalline waypoints. They're all safe. <clears throat> it's all dump and stir chemistry and it can all be telescoped. And so that's what makes this a great process route. But from the standpoint of a medicinal chemist, obviously this is not as good of a route. I will get there quicker with Ellie's route than I will with Carter. But when I need to make metric tons, I definitely am not gonna do what Ellie did. But both are great. Ellie gets a promotion in MedChem and Carter gets a promotion in process. But if the two switch roles, they both get demoted. Okay. How do you know when things are going to deprotonate and where? Well, uh, Carter pointed out that he could get deprotonation and put a lithium here. But you could also argue, well, why didn't he get deprotonation here? Or why didn't he get deprotonation there? It certainly could be a confusing topic. Well, in general, if there's a pyridine that has no substitution whatsoever, all of them are just protons for now, you can imagine that you could get deprotonation here or here. So what guides a selectivity? Well, what guides a selectivity is a kinetic or thermodynamic preference. In general, the thermodynamic outcome is going to be C4 deprotonation, and the kinetic is going to be C2. And the reason for this is because of the lone pair you've got on the nitrogen, which serves as a way of docking the metal. It kind of attracts the metal, brings it there into proximity, and then a deprotonation happens. But if you give it a chance to think about it, obviously there's going to be a lone pair repulsion. You've got that lone pair and you've got that anion right there. And if it has time to think about things, it's gonna say, wait a minute, I don't, I, that was a mistake to do that. I'm really not happy with the situation. Let's move it to something further away from that lone pair. And so the thermodynamic outcome that results from, let's say, a higher temperature or letting it equilibrate for longer uh, will give you uh, more of the thermodynamic outcome versus the kinetic. Now, how do you control one versus the other? Well, you can control this just by changing your base. Uh, for instance, if you use like Bewley, Bewley might give you more at lower temperatures of the kinetic product. Whereas if you use something like LDA, you might get more of the uh, thermodynamic product. So what happens when you start adding directing groups? So let's take, for example, the case of that compound or that compound. In the case of four fluoropyridine, where is the methylation going to go? Well, the fluorine 
is a great directing group. And so it will direct adjacent to it. In the case of the one that Carter just went through, you can imagine conditions to give you either one here based on kinetic or thermodynamic preferences. In general, though, you'll almost always get the C2 uh, deprotonation of the three fluoropyridine. And what about the case of this one? Not surprisingly, that's your exclusive lithiation product. Let's take a look at the book on page 20. This is summarized really well. The ways of getting C2 pyridyl anion versus C4 pyridyl anion. Through this chapter, there is a discussion of how you can use the innate preference of a pyridine to give you selectivity in the lithiation or CHC protonation step. And there's also a discussion of halogen metal exchange. So let's say you've got uh, a polyhalogenated compound. How do you know which is going to undergo this, the halogen metal exchange? And we'll talk about that um, in just a moment. That's really important. And then what about the effect of the directing group? The important thing to remember in this page is the relative sense of directing group capability. Even halogens can act as weak directing groups, not fluorine, but things like iodine, bromine, and chlorine. And then there are some very strong, I call them sneakest-like directing groups that are really, really good. Um, for instance, the NH Bach on a pyridine is a great directing group for lithiation. And in terms of selectivity that is a result of these, the directing groups always win over the nitrogen. So the nitrogen in a pyridine is not a great directing group. You can use it to control relative kinetic or thermodynamic deprotonation. But if you've got a directing group, that's where your eye should go. Focus on that when you think about the selectivity. OK, so let's think about how these ideas can contribute to the way you do retrosynthetic analysis when you use substitution as your primary vehicle to make a purity. Let's take a look at the bottom example and perhaps uh, Jun Chen can explain to us why this is strategic, but this is not strategic. Yeah, it, 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 the, the left one is strategic because it's reasonable. You can use the, the directing, you can use the floral directing group and the iodination institute to get the C3 iodized compound. Okay, great. And why is the one on the right just not feel right to you? Uh, that's really, uh, I don't know how to put a fluoride on pyridine, so it might be an issue. Well, you could use, here. you could deprotonate and use NFSI, for example, NFSI would do it. Okay, so. But why, why, I'm uh, trying to, get, yeah, I'm trying to understand how your intuition guides you to that one on the left rather than the one on the right as a viable disconnection. Mm. It, it's a chemoselectivity uh, thought, I think. You yeah, you know, that's a good point. So if you take 3 iodopyridine and you treat it with, a let's say, a base like Bewley, you have to yeah. worry about halogen metal exchange taking place before, you know, any kind of direction takes place. If you do LDA, LDA now is just one where it's like, okay, you've got the choice between this position and this position. It's not a fantastic directing group, iodine. And so the one that feels right is the one that gives you no ambiguity as to what is going to happen. The best consulting suggestions you can give to a person are ones where it's unassailable. There's no ambiguity. And so if you tell someone to make this compound via 3 iodopyridine, there's a lot of hand waving and uh and um, and a lot of references needed. If I give you the one on the left though, there's no ambiguity, nobody argues with you, you know there's only one result and that's why that's strategic. Now you can take this concept even further and think about functional group retrosynthetic priority, which is uh, something we came up with many years ago, seeing this over and over and over again. And this is the retrosynthetic priority that guides you to which disconnection should be made early on, that is which ones should be installed and which ones should be installed late meaning normally, which ones are you going to buy? So you're normally going to buy pyridines. It correlates really well with that have these groups already installed. And normally, the, as you get to the middle and towards the end, these are things you're generally going to install 
late in the synthesis. And so that's why they're disconnected retrosynthetically at an early stage. Let's take a look at how this can work in the context of problem of the day number one. There's a question from the outside. So let's hear it from Max. I just want to clarify that um, we can see through the right hand how to get C uh, to a force like to do with coordination. If you have a seat, the question from outside is if you have a C3 directing group, how to get control. And so the strategy one would use is trying to, it's really hard to overcome the C2 in the case of uh, C3 fluoropyridine. But what you would try to do is use equilibrating conditions, higher temperature, and that would usually guide it away, or at least give you mixtures guided away towards more of C4 versus C2. But those are the kind of strategies one will employ. Um, the directing group lithiation literature is replete. We've tried to summarize a lot of this in the, um, in the book here, but as you can see, those are the strategies on, in table one that you would normally want to try to uh, use to get uh, that kind of situation. So as you can imagine, the C4 pyridyl anion thermodynamic, you want longer reaction times, a little bit higher temperature, a solvent like THF, maybe people use additives as well, whereas the C2 pyridyl anion, you'd want to use maybe a base like Buley uh, and a, a non -co less coordinating um, solvent uh, and you know much lower temperature, short reaction time, so it doesn't have time to think about the situation. So that table is a good guidance to give you the idea of what conditions you should start off with and trying to control it. So yeah, great question from the outside. So for problem of the day number one, we need somebody to identify a unified starting material that can give us every isomer of that acid. I mean, think about how powerful that is to be able to start with one starting material and access all four isomers of this compound. Let's see if there's any volunteers to take this one. If not, I'll just call on someone. I'll jump in here. All right, what do you say, Alex? What's my starting material first off? Um, a two fluoropyridine, I think could get to all of these. All right, so how do I take two fluoropyridine and go from here to here? So that one's simple because you can just do uh, a direct lithiation and then throw in carbon dioxide, yeah. All right, good, good. Now, well, now what do I do about this next one? So that one, I guess in, like if you can block the three position, so throw uh, throw like a chlorine on there, and then you can do your directed lithiation, and then you can get rid of that chlorine. And you already taught us how to make the chloro. Comes back from there. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Now what? How do I make this one? So you could do the same sort of thing and you can uh, chlorinate in the three and four position and then that'll I'll let you put the is there acid another where way? you want. Is um, there if you way? put a larger um, uh, like kind of blocking group. So if you put TMS, yeah, that would be better. Normally people use silanes here as great blocking groups. And then when you do the lithiation, um, you can get selectivity for here, but the problem is you're also going to get a lot of competitive uh, deprotonation there. So in this particular case, one would choose the route you've shown to avoid any ambiguity at all. Okay. Uh, in, so how would you make that last one? And then kind of the same sort of idea you can I guess put the chloro group first and then put a TMS group, um, the, like the TMS ending up in the four position. Um, or you can do it opposite TMS first and then the chloro, and I guess that would be better. Why might this be a less desirable strategy? Um, well, you have the TMS blocking the four position, but I'm, I mean, you also have the chlorine directing, so I don't know. Yeah, there could I... be some, there could be some ambiguity there. At the end of the day, it might just be, you might find that this approach works just fine to make a compound like that. But, um, 
you know, I think this approach that you've outlined with the TMS blocking there gives you no ambiguity whatsoever. You're pretty much guaranteed to get the right product with that one. Fantastic. Uh, how would you do the uh, dechlorination? Just palladium on carbon, because there's no other offensive group there. Palladium on carbon hydrogen or formic acid, and you'll get rid of those chlorines right away. Okay, thanks. Great, great question, Nick. Let's take a look at a vivid display of this in action with uh, a case study two from the PCC book. So case study two is how to make this interesting little natural product from a substitution series of events. Uh, now, retrosynthetically, we can obviously bring the oxime back to the corresponding aldehyde. We then have two choices. We can imagine that aldehyde comes from a halogen metal exchange quenching with DMF, followed by a Suzuki coupling, or Suzuki coupling uh, followed by halogen metal exchange and DMF. Either one leads you back to the dihalo intermediate, where we have to recall our lecture number two on halo selectivity. And hopefully, we'll have a good halo selective way of uh, accessing one or two of those isomers. But retrosynthetically, it makes sense to take that risk and believe that you could differentiate those two groups. And that comes back to the dihalo intermediate you see here and leading us back to finally 3-hydroxypyridine. In the forward sense, let's go through it. So you take that 3-hydroxypyridine, you per iodinate it. It goes to the para and ortho positions in high yield. You then protect that phenol with, a mom, uh, with mom chloride. And that is a phenomenal directing group. So that mom group then can be used to do with just with LDA or LATMP, a hindered amide base, give you the anion, which can be quenched with trimethyl borate and then oxidize upon workup with peracetic acid to give the hydroxy compound that can be subsequently methylated. And now take a look at what they do. They use the directing group ability of the mom to get exclusive lithiation at C2. They then take that C2 lithiated species, transmetylate to the zinc, and then do a Nagishi reaction. And after acidic workup, the mom group gracefully departs. Following a quick uh, halogen metal exchange in the presence of that acidic proton, we'll see that again later, halogen metal exchanges take place near diffusion control and can be done in the presence of acidic functionality. Quenching with DMF gives the aldehyde and then finally, condensation with hydroxylamine gives you your natural product. Any questions on this route? Okay. Let's move on to another case study where we have to think about this interesting uh, three heterocycles linked to one uh, intermediate shown from this Pfizer paper in OPRD. So we need help with uh, Phil, what the intermediate. Can yeah? I interrupt the question before you start? Um, sure. How can you make the determination between um, uh, halogen metal exchange versus getting directed lithiation? My rule of thumb is like this. If you want to get halogen metal exchange, put sec buley or buley over the arrow. If you want to get, if you want instead to the halogen to just be a bystander and act as a directing group, use LDA as over the arrow. Now the actual conditions when you go to SciFinder might be, oh, it's better to use LITMP or whatever, but it'll be a hindered amide base. That's how you ensure that you get no halogen metal exchange. Okay? Okay, thank you. Good question. All right, so we need some building blocks. We need uh, to think about how to put this together in a modular fashion. Uh, what might be some good disconnections we can make? Camille, any I initial ideas or thoughts on disconnections for a compound like this? Um you could disconnect um, between the pyridine and the analog. Love it. So that's a great disconnection. And uh, as a result, we can put down that indole as our donor. It means that something will be left in its wake. Uh, what do you think that will be left in its wake? What is a good group here that would be uh, activated towards some sort of addition? Um, you could have an electrophile. 
great. So let's just put X here. It could be chlorine, for example. Great. Okay, another bond which might be worth considering the disconnection of. Anyone have an idea of how to simplify this? The arrow bond. The arrow bond, brilliant. Okay, so that gets us back to a couple of simple intermediates. And um, that's that one. And uh, we will use That's standing in a silly coupling. So the sequence of events will be silly coupling here and SNAR reaction there. Great. Let's take a look at how they made compound B. So compound B is subjected to triethyl orthoformate and Meldrum's acid, which gives us an initial adduct that looks something like what? Brendan, any ideas? Um. So I guess the, uh, the amine and the meldrum acid can be uh, merged together through, uh, <clears throat> through the enamine. Um, well, what happens with meldrum's acid and triethyl orthoformate? Uh, those are going to condense. <clears throat> and then I guess the amine can, can attack. Yep, and then the amine just comes in from the enamine. And then we're going to heat that thing up to 240 degrees, and the resulting product might be what? We'll retain our thiophene. Um, so I guess it's going to decarboxylate, and then um, the thiophene can can attack from its C2 position to form the what will be the uh, intermediate, uh, the the core of intermediate B after we treat it with. Uh, PLCL3 and then yeah, do the. So PLCL3 is going to take this and turn it into the chloropyridine. Yep. And then Bewley is going to deprotonate right here and quench with iodine and we get out our desired iodo product. Brilliant. Why did the lithiation go there? Stay tuned. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Right here is where we're going to talk about it. So in general, you might be wondering what is the hierarchy of CHC protonation within heterocycles. And if you have a pyro-like, that is a very acidic position. But Z cannot be a free NH because you get that. So if you try to take pyro and treat it with Bewley and expect to get C2 lithiation, we've seen that in past years and tests, you're not going to get any product. You're just going to get deprotonation. It makes it impossible to deprotonate that. So, so please don't do that. Z can be an oxygen, be a sulfur. We just saw benzothiophene a second ago. Those are really fast. These ones we covered, I think Alex covered these problems already when we talked about Stetter, when we talked about Dondoni, that CH bond becomes really, really acidic, okay? And then finally, you've got the pyridine case. Now you have two possible scenarios in the case of pyridine. You've got the case of regular pyridine. And let's say you've got the case of in the midazole, where you can recognize that is a pyridine-like nitrogen. However, that pyridine-like nitrogen with respect to deprotonation is a bit different than the one in the six-membered ring. So the six-membered ring is slower because of a lone pair repulsion. You can imagine geometrically that lone pair is closer to that hydrogen. Whereas in the five-membered ring, for geometry reasons, it's splayed out. And so there's actually lone pairs are actually helping to acidify that position. And there is not that kind of steric clash between the lone pair and the metal because it's kind of tied inward. So a five-membered pyridine nitrogen is going to be faster than a six-membered pyridine nitrogen. And that explains the selectivity we just saw right here. Does everybody get that? Fantastic. Well, let's take a look. We're not done with that compound. We still need to figure out how to make compound A. 
So how might we do this based on what we just talked about? We need to put a tin needs to go there. So any suggestions? Um, you could deprotonate the pyridine-like nitrogen, uh, the pyridine-like proton, and um, essentially block it and then uh, deprotonate the parole type position and then put a punch with tributyl pink chloride. Okay, Noor, that's a really good suggestion. And the question I have for you is based on the rules we just saw up here, why would you say that one's going to be faster than this one? I would assume it's more acidic uh, because it's uh, in an election, more electron deficient system. Well, as it turns out, it can't be controlled. And so when you treat this with Bewley and t and hexane, you actually get the dilithio species. We're gonna be stuck with that, Noor, so stick with me. We're then gonna do what you just suggested, which is use uh, tin chloride. We're gonna quench it and we make this compound. And I want you to tell me based on the exact logic you just used and what we talked about in lecture one and two, how might we convert that to A? I guess you can, um, I'm thinking something along the lines of SNAR type. Yeah, you got it. So uh, you know what? How about just add water and you get a uh, proto destanylation. And that brings us to a little interesting topic that is seen often in the, the modern uh, uh, medicinal chemistry era, which is the curious case of these types of Suzuki reactions. Which one do you think is going to be easier and why, Kelly? Um. I think the top one is going to be easier. Because? Because I guess based on the fact that when you consider a pyridine like nitrogen, that's the most reactive site. So this one looks a lot more like phenylboronic acid in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. And what might be the problematic part of using that with the Suzuki conditions, which usually involve some hydroxide present? Uh, can you get reaction at the three position on that one? Well, in this case, when you treat this with the conditions of Suzuki that are hydroxide-like, we're going to see the same thing that Nora just suggested a moment ago with the C2 proto destanylation the main, often the main product mm -hmm. that beleaguers medicinal chemists is proto-deborylation. And so a whole cottage industry of a hundred different papers have come out to try to solve this problem. There are many different solutions to it. Um, for instance, one is to use a protecting group for the boronic acid, like a MITA or DAN group. Another is some people have shown that a trifluoroborate can be more robust. Another is to use copper chloride as an additive. Uh, there are a lot of different papers out there. My favorite is the copper chloride condition of Merck. Uh, if you're in industry now and you want that paper, Max can send it out to your Tucker later on. Uh, but that's usually the way that people solve this problem of the C2, C3 dichotomy in Suzuki couplings. Now let's move on to this interesting example of a free NH imidazole. So when we take this and we treat it with T. Buley, what do you think happens based on what we just saw in the previous example. Nathan, any suggestions? Uh, would you lithiate the position between the two nitrogens? And then uh, you add into the carbonyl. Anybody disagree with that? Shouldn't it just depronate the nitrogen and then it's dead to lithiation? Uh, any other suggestions? Lithium halogen exchange. That's rather daring to suggest. So you want us to believe we're gonna do a 
lithium halogen exchange in the presence of that NH? Anybody agree with that one? It's all about the hierarchy of rates. So when we treat with something like T. Buley, T. Buley is going to have a voracious appetite for halogens. Halogen metal exchange with something like T. Buley or Sec. Buley or even Buley in a case like this is going to take place, as I mentioned before, with diffusion control. We saw this in the case of cerulomycin, case study number two that we just covered in the PCC book. We had a free phenol and we were able to do a lithiation uh, halogen metal exchange of a C2 bromopurity in the presence of that free hydroxy. Same thing goes here. Just what uh, I don't I don't know who said it, but um, whoever that was, get some Dogecoin. Uh, this is going to happen first, very very quickly, and then quenching before even deprotonation can happen. In fact, you can get halogen metal to exchange to happen even in something like methanol before deprotonating the methanol. It's that quick, and uh, one of the slowest processes that's going to happen is is the C2 uh, lithiation definitely deprotonation would happen before that would happen. And I don't know how you would actually get that to work without using some sort of protecting group on that nitrogen. Uh, because if you use something like LDA, all that would happen is you deprotonate the in imidazole. Questions? Hey, Phil. Yeah. How does this change if the bromide was instead a chloride? Oh, that's a good question. In that case, because the rate of chloro in a case like this, I believe that you would just get deprotonation. Could be wrong. We can look it up. Uh, it's a good question there, Carter, but things change quite a bit when you go to chlorine. Definitely not a good halogen for a halogen metal exchange. You usually need very specialized conditions to get the chloro to react with like a bromo or iota. But that's a great point. Please don't put on the test chlorine atoms that are then treated with Buley and converted to lithium. Uh, so, and if you have mean? a... Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so would that mean in the case of if you had an iota group, would it then have the theme halogen exchange if you had inbuli in that case or deprotonation? Aaron, you said what if we had an iota instead of a bromo? Yeah, would you have, okay. would Same you reaction. then deprotonate with inbuli or would you still have lithium halogen exchange? Exactly what you just said. You'd still have lithium halogen exchange and even faster. Yes, iodine even faster, bromine super quick, chlorine, fluorine, the dead. So can you distinguish if you have both? Iodine and bromine, can you distinguish between them? Yeah, I've I, I go first. yes, I've seen people do that. You can. Okay. Yes. Okay, so based on what we just saw, then the obvious product when we treat this oxazole with uh, Buley is going to be what? Lithiation in between the nitrogen and the oxygen. What if I told you that none of this product was formed? You'll have fragmentation. In fact, yes, the product that you form is this scary creature that goes by way of this intermediate. Which is then quenched with TMS chloride. So in order to avoid ring opening, uh, the late Ed Vedas invented a really brilliant method that allows you to overcome this problem by adding an equivalent of borane. This is a phenomenal trick to use. Now this ring opening process is stopped. And so if you first add borane and then you deprotonate, you can get the exact product that um, you said initially. Questions on that? Great. Let's get the problem of the day number two, which sets a stage for perhaps the most confusing part of lectures one through three. So problem of the day number two takes this intermediate, in, interesting iodinated arene, treats it with LDA. The iodine has somehow moved around and somehow that 
carbamate has now made a carbon-carbon bond. So some weird stuff is going on here, something mystical perhaps. We need uh, a very deep thinker to try to guide us through this, maybe, maybe Tawe. And if Tawe is not on the line, well, I'm here. Oh, you're okay. What do you say, Tawe? Um, <laughs> First, tell me, uh, what do you think this is good at doing? Uh, I think the protecting group of uh, hydroxyl group. Okay, but it's a weird one, isn't it? Yeah. And what do you think it likes to do when it sees a metal? I think it would coordinate with lithium and it helps the uh, iodide to eliminate. Okay, so one possibility is that it accentuates the ability of halogen metal exchange to happen. What's another conceivable outcome? Oh. Oh, it, it would. Any, any thoughts on what might happen? Uh, the nitrogen would coordinate with lithium and the LDA would de uh, deprotonate uh, the alpha proton. Brilliant. So we're going to get a lithium here, right. chlorine, chlorine, and now we've got that. Now you need to fight, try to guide everyone here how we're going to get this strange product at the end where the iodine has somehow magically moved over yeah hmm maybe the the lithium iodide exchange product is more stable thermodynamically i like your background music by the way uh oh, oh. Nice. We should have you leave that on all the time. You know, in past years, we used to teach this class with the music behind, and that really helped me, my train of thought, but I don't know if that's going to work over Zoom anymore. Okay, so you're <laughs> suggesting that the lithium goes here, and you're absolutely right, but the mechanism by which it does this is really, really interesting. So the first thing you said when we started off was, you said, this is going to do lithium halogen exchange, correct? Yeah. LDA is a really bad way of doing that. But guess what is a good reagent for that? Something like phenylithium. So yeah. we'll label this compound as A, and I'm going to react it with compound A, and I'm going to make this compound, which I guess is the same as that one along with a small amount of this compound. Um, you see how that happens? Uh, it's, the, it's the left one, it's the iodide should be lithium. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, you're right, thank you. Oh. Great, that's right. So when you treat this with A, you're gonna get exactly what you first, this was your initial suggestion. Tawe, yeah. that's fantastic. And that's going to give you a little bit of, of this compound plus this compound. Now I have a choice. When I'm taking this compound that's been generated, a little bit of this guy and a little bit of this guy are together in a room. It's going to say, well, which iodine is going to be the better one to do the halogen metal exchange. And the rules you use for CHC protonation are the same rules you use for halogen metal exchange in a polyhalogenated species. There's a directing group here. There's a directing group here. Yeah. That's the one that goes. Well, this and one's more active. Yes. And then finally the sequence ends with an anionic freeze rearrangement to give you the product. Yeah. And oh. this is known as a halogen dance. 
So the apparent product is a halogen migration, but how it happened is via the intermediates you see here. We're gonna spend a lot of time in halogen dance. So if this is confusing to you, don't worry, it should be. It's supposed to be confusing, but hopefully by the end of this little 20 minute diatribe, it no longer is confusing if I've done my job properly. Okay, let's dance. So if we take uh, a three iodo two fluoropyridine and we treat it with something like, uh, we can just use n -buley. that's fine. And we treat it with n -buley. what are some of the things that might happen? Um, how about Daniel? Anything you say could be right here. Um, I would think lithium halogen exchange. Okay. Uh, but, uh, no, but why are you budding? Given, given the halogen dance, I would think deprotonation would happen at the four position as well, or is likely to occur. Lovely. Now, uh, what can happen next? By analogy to problem of the day number two, we just talked about what could happen. This now takes the role of a strong metallated lithium species that can do another halogen metal exchange, can't it? Uh, so you would react it with the starting material to form the uh, diiodo species, um, as well as uh, the uh, lithiated product at the at the three position exactly so yeah yeah be um and, and now then, we have b floating around don't we the compound you initially suggested what is b going to do to a species like that uh halogen at the three position of the diodo yes 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 why did you choose to go there um Is it more kinetically favored or? It's everything favored because you have two directing groups here and here. Oh, so oh. The same yeah. rules you use for CHT protonation with regards to directing group. I want you to do the same thing with regards to halogen metal exchange. Okay. Are there, if the fluorine could be replaced with another stronger directing group, could you get immediate lithium halogen exchange from the starting material? Or like oh, is, yeah, is... Yeah, yes, yes, say yes, exactly. We're going to get to that. So let's say I, I quench this with CO2. That's my product, just so you have a real, what a real product would look like in this reaction. But what you're asking is the next topic, which is how do you control the dance? Like, it's kind of annoying if this happens when you didn't want it to happen, isn't it? Right? So let's talk about that. Luckily, there's a whole section in the book on it. So, um, yeah. Do those types of pyridines eliminate to form uh, pyridines or like a they can, they can under the right conditions. But what we're going to be talking about now is how to avoid and how to propagate a halogen dance uh, reaction. So here it is in all the gory details, but we already went through this. So um, there is a prototypical examples of how a halogen dance can work. Um, we'll go through it again for the example we just saw. We treat this with some sort of lithiating agent. I'll get to which one is a good one to use in a moment. It gives you a directed lithiation at the adjacent position to the X. It then reacts with another molecule of starting material to essentially give a disproportionation where you now have uh, the dihalo intermediate and the starting lithiated, the apparent product of a halogen metal exchange. Now that compound can act as its own halogen metal exchange reagent reacting again with that dihalo intermediate to give you that product, which after quenching gives you the appearance that the halogen has moved over. But let's look at a case where halogen dance won't work. Remember, halogen dance is guided by thermodynamics. It will only happen if it's going downhill. It's like a radical reaction, a cyclization. You only want to go to the thermodynamically more stable product. So the bottom example is one where you're likely not going to get a lot of halogen dance because you do your directing 
uh, your directing group does its halogen, uh, its deprotonation, CHD protonation, but there's really no guy, there's no driving force for the formation of the product uh, that is that is halogen halogen dense because the product is less stable than the starting material. And instead, the only product that you see is the product of a simple D CHD protonation with no dancing to occur. So the dancings do not go uphill. The dancings go downhill. How do you get a dance to happen? And how do you prevent it from happening? Well, to promote halogen dance, you want to use something like low temperature. That makes sense. You don't want an excess of base. Often to, accent, to propel a halogen dance, people will use 0 0.7, 0 0.8 equivalents of base. You want to add the base to the halide so you can propagate the cycle to make that dihalogenated intermediate. You use a solvent like uh, THF, and you want to use a slow reacting electrophile like CO2 or DMF or TMS chloride. Whereas HD prevention, TMS chloride may not be a good one, by the way, C stick to CO2 and DMF. HD prevention would be higher temperature, um, excess of base, so you can't get the propagation of the cycle, the addition of the halide to the base, so you never can get that trihalogen, dihalogen intermediate, a solvent like THP, and a fast reacting electrophile, like maybe iodine, for example. Um, okay, so let's go to more examples so that it, the concept gets driven really, why, really strongly. Why does, why does lower temperature favor the halogen dancing? At higher temperature, I, this is sort of a, um, because you want the propagation to happen. So this intermediate step that's going on right here, the intermediate step of this propagation happens at low temperature. At higher temperature, you're likely just going to get an immediate, um, rather than the propagation going on in this, in this middle section, you'll get an immediate simple quenching of the initial metallated intermediate at higher temperature. It will just stick I see. So, so it will just get trapped, yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, let's take a look at this difluorinated pyridine, and I want you to try to help me find conditions to make all three possible iodinated materials. So I want to put an iodine at all of the arrows provided. So who can help us do this? What would happen if we just started off with lithiation? So uh, maybe Stone can help us with this. What's the sort of easiest iodinated product to get? Uh, C4. All right, that one, that one's a, a freebie. How do we get the next one over? Could you take uh, your product and then lithiate again? And then you'd have halogen dance uh, at the C5 position. What would be your quenching reagent? Uh, iodine. No, just a proton. So we do exactly what you said. Halogen dense conditions will give us the product here with a lithium. And then we just quench with water or methanol or HCl, whatever. So if you quench with iodine, you'd get the diiota product out. And finally, how do we get the one at the para position? We can use a trick perhaps we learned before. You can use a blocking group. So the TMS group at the four position. Normally people use NIS here, but I guess you could use I2. And then finally TVAP, remove that blocking group. Fantastic. Great. How about a uh, question? Yeah, we have two related questions. Two related questions um, from the audience. Basically about solvent effects and favoring halogen dance. Why does THF prefer halogen dance propagation? Um, it has to do with, I mean, these are uh, phenomenological sort of aggregate state uh, changes that, that just sort of give you one or the other. 
Um, in terms of trying to rationalize why a um, solvent might be better than another, um, this is one of those factors that's not really, uh, you know, there's not really a good ex good explanation for why this happens. It's, um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a good explanation. We can send out a review on uh, why this might be, but nobody really has a good example or a good real explanation for why the solvent might be, you know, changing from THP to THF. It's just aggregate state. So it's kind of an empirical observation is the best I can do for you right now. But for an exam, all you would need to do is HD promoted over the arrow, right? So you wouldn't need to memorize conditions from a Schlosser paper that would give you HD. You would just say HD promoted. That's enough. So it's all basically empirical observation. There is no way to rationalize and predict, for example, with solvent. For, for example, with ether, if you use ether, is it going to disfavor the horizon down score? Well, you have, you've got trends that you can take advantage of. So the, the book and the reviews have trends of solvents that will be better to use for uh, promoting HD. One thing is clear is that H, uh, halogen dance is a predictable thing. Okay. So if you, you can predict it, you can rationalize it. And then the little intricacies of how do you get your yield up and how do you promote it? There are small empirical things like solvent choice. And sometimes one base might be better than another in a particular instance. Uh, but it's hard for me to give you a like, you know, guaranteed okay. rationale to explain it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good questions. Let's take a look at uh, the case of this bromo CF3. Now I want you to put a CO2 at each of these positions. So what are we going to do? So I think in using the logic you talked about with like NBO and secondary versus um, Shooting based or uh, nitrogen bases, you can use LDA, um, which would not be as uh, favorable for lithium halogen exchange. So you can do LDA and then uh, quench with CO2 to get um, carboxylation. At, yeah. at, um, if the, in this case, the bromine is a directing group. So it would be right, yeah, right there. Um, lithiation and then quench. Okay, a lot of doge coming your way there, Tim. That's fantastic. What are your thoughts on how we might, uh, for even more coins, how, how might we get the other isomers using this technique? Yeah, sure. So here, if you do that LDA, um, again, to get that lithium there, you can quench with iodine instead um, and then do halogen dance to put that at the four position uh, and then the same iteration um, where you can use base um, and make that into the carboxylic acid. So you could use Grignard conditions, let's say. And um, the iodide is gonna react far faster than the bromide, don't worry about that. And that will give you that one. How about the final one? How do we get it? near to the CF3. Yeah, so from that first intermediate you drew after the LDA, you can um, quench with TMS chloride uh, and using a, the blocking logic, um, your C4 position is now blocked. Uh, and then in the presence of base, you would deprotonate at the other site, um, excluding the lithium halogen exchange bit. Uh, and then you would, yeah, exactly, lithium there and then quench with CO2. Oh, uh, then Tiba. I have a question about this. Um, yep, please ask. So how, how would you, I guess, both the CF3 group and the Bromo groups are directing. How would you judge which one would be the stronger? All, all about the hierarchy. So a little bit of memorization is needed. It's in the book um, of the, what is a strong, what is a moderate, what is a weak. And a Bromo is going to be, a B, CF3 is not a really good directing group. It's very weak. Um, whereas a bromo is also not a super one, but it's better than CF3. So that's the kind of thing you need to, need to commit to memory. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, would you still expect small amounts of regio isomers then uh, if we started with some directing of the CF3 group? No, the bromo is, is, pretty, is 
is good enough that you're going to get a major product to be that lithiation there. All right. Tucker, is something? Yeah, we have another outside question. Outside question? About, uh, is it used in process scaling the halogen dance and much larger scale limitations? Uh, I have not seen halogen dance used in process chemistry. It could be used if there is a very, very strong directing effect. The problem with halogen dance, as you can imagine, is concentration effects on scale. So because of the intricacy of the mechanism, I don't, I mean, it may be, there may be some in the audience who, who is a process chemist at a big company who's screaming right now saying, yes, we use it all the time. I haven't in my personal experience seen process chemists use it. I don't see a reason why it couldn't be used if the system is set up properly, but this is used all the time in MedChem. I've seen it dozens of times over the past 20 years, people in, process, in MedChem using halogen dance or, or doing it inadvertently. Okay, let's take I, a look. I have one question sure. about deprotonation in, in that yeah. system. Um, could you use a bulkier base like LITMP? Oh yeah, absolutely. To, to H just get direct. Oh, C4, you mean C4, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, perhaps, um, although in general, the directing group, as I said before, for the purposes of having some general rules in mind, imagine that the directing group is strong enough that it's going to stop that from happening. So the directing group will usually override the innate preference of a pyridine. Yeah, so there may be, you know, there's thousands of papers out there, folks. There may be an exception to what I'm saying, but the general rule is that the directing group wins. It's strong enough that you can't get it to move over. Okay, does that make sense? Hey, Phil, I have, a, I have a quick question just about sure. this. You mentioned um, Grignard, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the selectivity of that for the bromine versus iodine. Is it just that iodine is heavier? Uh, that's correct. So you use here uh, no shells, turbo, Grignard, isopropyl magnesium chloride. In general, this sort of effect of relative rates of halogen reactions also transcend into the world of palladium. So for instance, the rate of a HEC reaction on this compound is about a thousand times faster with the iodo than on the bromo. Same goes for Sangashiro. Uh, same goes for a lot of things like almond chemistry, the same story. So, and indeed also making Grignard reagents. So you can use this orders of magnitude faster reactivity of an iodo bromo to get halo-selective reactions. Question from the outside? Uh, is it not on pseudo Oh, halogen dance does not occur on pseudohalides. So tosyl groups don't migrate. Uh, no. Yeah, good question. No, this is limited. Halogen dance is limited to halogens, at least to, to my knowledge. Let's take a look at the case before we go back to the book of um, when you take these dibromothiophenes and you treat them with LDA and electrophile. So based on all the dancing we've been doing, you should all be dancing experts. And therefore, if I randomly call on a name, they should be very, how about Nguyen uh, in California? Um, so first you, for the first example, you have the deprotonations at the C3 position. Uh, so for this one, you mean C3, let me, let me label them. Uh, yeah, then, then that would be C4, sorry. So that's a great uh, example here of um, where we should be talking about the hierarchies of directing group effects. So in the case of a pyridine, the directing effect is weak. So to Daniel's question earlier about how you could use a very big base to maybe get the C4 selectivity is different than a thiophene. Let's go back up to the hierarchy that we had here. These are super favorable deprotonations. In fact, so much more favorable even than a directing group can override. So if we go down here, the lithiation event that takes place first, this is a weak directing group. And this is an innately very, very primed in acidic position. So the initial lithiation product is that one, Nguyen. Okay. Okay. So now what happens after that? We quench this with an electrophile. So is the product just um, quenched with an electrophile? Uh, I, 
there will be the halogen exchange with the starting material at the C2 bromide, I believe. Aha. Uh -huh. So we don't get that. And instead, we make a little bit of this thing. And um, in order to make that, it needed to take it from somewhere. It took it from here. So in that process of dancing, behind the scenes, there was also a little bit of this one made, right? Yes. So we've got this species around. We've got this species around. The two of them need to meet together and make a decision. Now, based on what I've told you, Nguyen, we've got this precursor here, we've got this reagent here. Which of the three bromines do you think will undergo halogen metal exchange? We've got A, B, and C. Um, the C1 will undergo the halogen metal exchange because you have both directing group pointing towards the C position. Brilliant, awesome, awesome job. Now the same logic can be used in the dibromothiophene shown here. So when we take this one and we deprotonate it with LDA, what do you think is going to happen? So we start with the um, deprotonation at C3 and C4 because it's just only one position now. Lovely. Then we have the halogen exchange to make the same compound and we end up the same product. You got it. Brilliant. So let's reflect for a moment. I think this probably would have been confusing um, an hour ago. Hopefully now it's not confusing and rather intuitive, but really beautiful that you can start off with these two different materials and they thermodynamically coalesce into the same uh, 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 electrophile product. Let's take a look at case study number one, which is kind of the ultimate manifestation of this type of phenomenon. Case study number one. That one's a doozy. You've got the dimethoxy, the bromo, the amide there. And this may, you know, this is a, a good page of the book to study because it is exactly what you would do if you were a medicinal chemist thinking about the roots that you could use to put this together. So let's take a look at why the root at the top here, I'm not able to annotate the screen, but um, at the top, why are these three retrosynthetic arrows with the X is not good? Well, because selective SNAR reactions are going to be very difficult on those types of compounds. So you don't wanna propose something like that. So we wanna move backwards and disconnect early the bromo Right? If we look at that table we talked about before, the bromo is probably going to be one we want to disconnect early, leading us to the intermediate you see in the dead center of the screen. And then you can imagine that arises from a selective SNAR on the top, which is that's a decent disconnection. And then you can imagine you could put a halogen there, that's decent. And that could get us back finally to the 5-halo-2 carboxypyridine. That is a certainly viable retrosynthesis. You could write that on a test and you get full credit. In the middle though, if we move down and think about the other methoxy as arising from a SNAR reaction, it leads us to the five halo four methoxy intermediate, which can be brought back through some sort of hopefully lithiation event as we'll see in a moment. And that gets all the way back to a picolinamide shown there, a halo picolinamide. That's what they actually did. Let's take a look at the forward route. So the forward route does a chlorination and acid chloride formation. It then makes the corresponding amide by dumping in isopropylamine. We treat that 4-chloropyridine with sodium methoxide. It gives us a clean SNAR reaction. We then deprotonate it with Bewley. We've got two fine directing groups there. They help put it at the C3 position. That's where the iota goes. We use a hindered amide base now to deprotonate the only position left open. You've got a great directing group. That methoxy is great. It directs it towards C5. The lithium goes there, you get the dihalogen and intermediate, it then does the halogen dance to give the switcheroo of the iodine to the opposite spot. You then add that sodium methoxide with copper iodide and a kind of almond type reaction to give the dimethoxy compound. And again, you can use the lithiation to 
direct at C3 because you got two great directing groups there. It goes straight there. And look what happens after that. We treat that with LDA and we dance again. So two different dances to move bromines and iodines around a ring. This is phenomenal. Is anybody confused by this? We can go I have through. A question. Yes. Uh, not about the halogen dancing, but okay. with the, uh, being able to do selective SNIR, can't you also do that selectively, even if you have two halogens around, if you have two different halogens on the ring and have selectivity between those two? Yeah. In this particular case, however, the selective SNAR is difficult because you've got, in the case of the one on the very left, you've got a bromine and let's say another uh, group there that is, you know, C2 versus C4. You could possibly get selectivity, but it's not a great consulting suggestion because people are going to be like, the first thing they're going to say is, how do you know you're going to get that one? And you're going to, again, you're going to do hand waving on um, maybe conditions, blah, blah, blah. And they never hire you again. And the top one, the same thing. The SNAR is difficult because you've got a para electron withdrawing group and you've got the ortho C2 bromo. Again, you can wave hands and say, here's some papers I found that C2 goes first instead of C3. It's just not unassailable, right? So we're looking for the suggestion to the people that there's no, you can walk away and know it's going to work. And the only reason it doesn't work is because they set it up wrong. Not okay. because your idea was bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there are some nuances associated with this and you can make some you know, suggestions that in certain cases you may have no choice but to make such a suggestion. Yes, yes. Yeah, questions? Um, just a quick question, um, not related to the halogen dance, but actually the first up, like, uh, is it the uh, electrophilic substitution on the first step to install the chlorine to the pyridine ring? Yeah, so there's a docking um, of the nitrogen to the SOCl2 and then an addition into that pyridinium of chloro at the power position. It's not, okay. it's a, yeah. So it's more like you oxidize the nitrogen to like the NCl plus to make you make the N plus with the NCl bond and you have the chloride add into the four position in nucleophilic manner rather than just a, it's an electrophilic substitution, right? I don't believe you get N chloro. I believe you're getting an NSO uh n sulfur adduct that's what okay. happened yes okay but basically it's an x with x is some kind of living group correct okay exactly Thanks. exactly uh, great for question the, for the halogen dance um is it normally is it always possible to drive it to completion or there is some sometimes a danger of ending up with a mixture of you know for dihalo compound and yeah so and these are examples where it is so um it is so clean because there's multiple directing groups giving it really no choice but to go to their desired spot. So the yield is high, but often, so these would be good candidates for process chemists to employ halogen dance. Like I think these would work well on a ton scale. Where it, where it falters is where there's some nuanced reactivity and it can go either way or it's very weakly directing. And in those cases, the yields don't often go above 70% and you do get some byproducts in the reaction. So that is a caveat of HD for large scale work. It's also a caveat because it's run at negative 78, which is difficult to do on really big scale. That's always a problem. I mean, you know, it depends what process chemists you talk to. Some of them say, well, we're using flow these days. We can handle cryogenic, but Kelly is totally right. Uh, cryogenic is usually something that they desperately want to avoid. They'll do these lithiations and they'll do halogen metal exchange and they'll often try to get it as high of a temperature as they can. Minus 20, zero degrees. And so these higher temperatures don't favor HD. And that's why maybe is another reason, good point, Kelly, that HD is not really used very much in process to, that I've seen. And if someone in the audience has done it, please email us and we'll include that example. Okay. Well, that concludes CHD protonation. Um, we only have 15 minutes left and we may not make it to the rest of the lecture, but that's fine because as I mentioned, this year we don't have to rush because the remainder of lecture three is most of it online. So if we don't finish in time, we will simply adjourn it with the exact time and you can watch the rest of it on the 2019 edition. Let's take a look at how radicals can be used in functionalizing various heterocycles. And um, one sort of emblematic example of this is a synthesis of this ergot alkaloid precursor shown here. So we need a good disconnection on this molecule. Wonder if there's any suggestions out there, um, 
maybe Simona or maybe Nathan or... Yeah, so you can oh. disconnect between the carbonyl and the pyridine um, in a menisci type disconnection. Fantastic. And yeah, that traces you back to an acyl radical, which you can get from an oxalate. Brilliant. So the Minisky reaction, one of medicinal chemists favorite reactions to do has definitely become more of a popular thing to do in the past uh, 10 years or so uh, because of the realization of the remarkable chemoselectivity of the process under more modern conditions that don't normally require uh, the very harsh old style conditions, which I think turned off a lot of medicinal chemists. And in the sort of canonical manifestation, one takes a acid, and they treat it with something like silver nitrate and something like a persulfate, sodium or ammonium persulfate. And that gives you your radical. So the silver and the persulfate get together and you get uh, silver two plus SO4 anion. And then the silver two is the active species to take this thing down to the radical, which gives you back silver one plus CO2 plus a proton. So when you have a charged heteroaromatic, those charged heteroaromatics, which you generate by in situ protonation, normally people do this with an acid like TFA, H2SO4. The old conditions are usually boiling it in the acid, and that gives you. Uh, substitution. Now let's take a look at uh, Simona's suggestion and how we make that oxalate. So the first step is treating this with KH, then n then trimethyl borate, and then finally the bromo compound and some palladium. And following that, all we need to do is make the corresponding oxalate with oxal chloride. So who can guide us through um, how this works? Maybe maybe Tiffany can tell us what is going on with the KH step and then the Buley and then the trimethyl borate. What's going on there? Um, I guess the pronation. Or... Yeah, yeah, you said it keeps just finishing. Yeah, yeah the yeah. Okay, so we're going to put K there. Now what? Um... Then, I guess, you, oh. Any thoughts on what Buley might be doing here? Lithium, how oh, lithium? that sounds great. So I'm going to put a lithium right there. Then I'm going to quench it with trimethyl borate. That'll give me my boronic acid. And then I do palladium. So the key here is the Buley is a protecting group. Uh, I'm sorry, the KH is a protecting group for the NH. And you may say, hey, Phil, didn't you just tell us before that we could do a halogen metal exchange even in the presence of an NH? Sometimes that works. But in the case of a, a poor electrophile like trimethyl borate, it's not as good of an electrophile. Then you actually, in the, in the case of an indole, you'll usually want to uh, deprotonate it with something like sodium hydride or potassium hydride first, and that enables the halogen metal exchange to take place just in a cleaner and more reproducible fashion. Phil, would it just quench itself and so you would get the lithiated? Um, yeah, that's, that's of okay. course. So if you know, you're using a nucleophile, which doesn't react very quick, so you'll get halogen metal exchange, and then it'll just find another indole lying around, and they'll say, hey, I want that proton, I'm done. And you get just the product is just deep bromination and you're over. Exactly. Yep. So menisci can be very useful to achieve CH functionalization. Notice we don't say CH activation. 
no CH bonds were cleaved during these processes, uh, but it gives the appearance of a cleavage event. So it's essentially a CH functionalization, but hey, so is a Friedel Crafts and an Aldol reaction. So, but these ones are more of a CH functionalization feel to them. So a compound like this can obviously just trace back to pyridine and you can use something like um, protected proline. This is from a Merck process paper in Orglet. Um, this one can come from pyridine and a variant of the menisci called the borano menisci. So you can take aeroboronic acids and you can treat them with menisci conditions and they give you uh, the product that you would expect. Um, in this case, you can use a sneaky little reagent called uh, a diversinate or a sulfonate, which generates when you heat it up in the presence of an oxidant, will generate the corresponding radical. Usually TBHP is used, but other means of activation can be used as well. In the case of this one, this is just old, old style Fenton chemistry. So you can just take dioxane, you can use some iron filings and TBHP. These are really weak CH bonds. And so they're kind of like cheater substrates, but it's really useful. In the case of the benzofuran shown here, you can use the exact same logic. So you can start off with um, this compound because there's no regiochemistry issues. X can be equal to N2 diazonium and then it's a so-called Shore reaction, or it can be equal to a boronic acid, and you can use the same borano meniski conditions to get the product. And then finally, the compound shown here, maybe someone, uh, who do we have from Shenvi's group? I know Simona's in Shenvi's group, there might be others. Uh, what would you say here is a good disconnection? Uh, you can disconnect uh, from like a sclerolide derivative and the chloropyridine. Um, so what you can get from like a Suzuki cross coupling um, and then the menisci. Brilliant. So you could, let's just put it like this. You need to make that radical, right? Yes. Yes. So we can get that radical from the corresponding olefin using iron acac and phenylsilane. You could also get it from the corresponding acid. You could also get it from the corresponding alcohol by making the xanthate or making the oxalate. So however way you wanna make that radical, that will then cyclize close to give you the product. So we will close with a little consulting corner here. It's a, area of questions that I get quite often, which is um, exemplified with the two examples I show here. A typical question I will get is, um, hey, Phil, uh, we want to do a radical addition, and we want to understand how to control the selectivity. One of the main reasons that people avoided menisci chemistry for a long time was the perception that radicals simply couldn't be controlled very well. And as a consequence, uh, people viewed them as being somewhat inferior means of functionalization. But that's because they were not consulting. Because when you talk to a medicinal chemist, they often like to get racemic mixtures of compounds. They often like to get regioisomeric mixtures of compounds because guess what? Those are bonus analogs for them. So the mixtures are not necessarily a problem, but sometimes they like to find out if there is a way to controllably get one or the other. Now, the advantage of doing menisci chemistry on a pyridine is that you have the nitrogen and that nitrogen can be protonated. And once you do that, it changes everything. So protonation of this compound and submission to a radical would give, which adduct do you think? How about, um, Tanner? Sorry. 
So, so if you protonate the bottom pyridine, let's, you would, let's, go with, let's go with this one first. Uh, protonate that, and I want to know what do you think what might be the major product? The one next to the methyl. Okay, great. And why do you say that? Um, we want uh, people who agree or disagree to speak up now or forever you hold your peace. So you're saying that when I protonate here, I make that position more delta plus. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. Okay, anybody disagree or agree? I would say the four position. Yeah, I agree that it would be four. Let me ask you this question. Do you see the analogy of that oxonium to that iminium? You wouldn't expect that this would be delta plus here, would you, Tanner? No. So would you like to revise the answer? Um, yeah, then we should go to the four position. Brilliant. So when you protonate, you'll get selectivity here. However, when you, you, when you have no proton source present, the directing group, look at the nitrile hiding here. I didn't mention it, but it's a good pi acceptor and it activates such that you would expect the major product to be perhaps here, or you could also imagine potentially there. Same thing goes for this one. If you protonate, you're gonna get that as the major product with a proton source and you'll get this as the major product without a proton source. Now, uh, turns out we, we wrote a paper on this a long time ago, ancient history, but um, there is a really good way. We worked on this with Donna Blackman's group many, many years ago. Uh, and lead author, Fionn, really talented medicinal chemist at Roche now, um, worked on the rules and regulations for radical addition. So this is a very useful guide. Uh, I know a lot of medicinal chemists have found it useful to take you through the first uh, thought of how you would design a route using selective radical chemistry. Nobody does chemistry just on pyridine. Often not, right? You usually have substituents on it. So you know where your innate reactive positions are. Your groups incur either conjugate reactivity or donating reactivity. And that then changes the, sen the sense of innate reactivity. Then you want to look at the step three, which is the sites that are activated as a consequence of electron donating or neutral groups, such as a halide or a C2 electron withdrawing group, a C2 electron donating group, or a methyl group then you add the effect together and you decide on your conditions, whether you're gonna promote the innate reactivity by adding acid, or whether you're gonna reduce the innate reactivity incurred by the nitrogen of the pyridine and promote the conjugate addition reactivity of the substituent in something like the MSO. How does it work in principle, in action? So here's a typical pyridine. Those are innately reactive sites, C2 and C4. Our conjugate site is going to be at C5. And so step three, now we look at the effect of the methyl. The methyl is going to uh, be activating ortho and the ester is going to deactivate at C6. We add the effects together in a little traffic light and we determine which conditions we want to use. If we want to promote innate reactivity, we're going to go for adding acid and it's going to probably go adjacent to the methyl. And if we want to promote conjugate reactivity, we want to use uh, conditions that get rid of the acid. And indeed, when you treat this with a radical reaction under acidic conditions, you get R group that is consistent with the innate reactivity, ortho direction of that methyl group. And when you treat it under DMSO, no acid conditions, the selectivity gets dominated by the effect of the electron withdrawing group on the C2 position of the pyridine. Fantastic. Any questions? All right, so we have uh, one minute left. And uh, luckily, the, this last uh, bit of material, I'm going to skip this bit of material. It's on the YouTube video. A great advantage of doing this over Zoom. We don't need to cover any of this. Uh, we covered all of this in 2019, so please look at it. Um, I think something that's interesting to keep in mind is the effect of the type of heterocycle on the substituents, which we have talked about a little bit already. So for example, in the Boger synthesis of Fredericomycin, which position when we treat this with LDA, do we think we're gonna deprotonate? 
How about um, Deb? Yeah, um, I think you have two choices. Of course, you can deprotonate on the pyridine or on the metal, but in this case, I think it's going to undergo on the metal because yes. it looks like uh, a ketone. Exactly. Almost. So if you go to the YouTube video, you'll find out what happens next. But in fact, that is just like a ketone, just as Debbie said. And in the case of Singular, same story. We're going to make a disconnection just like that because uh, quinoline with a methyl group is just like this. So you can do a simple aldol or canovinago reaction and that's how Singular was made on process scale by Merck. Just a simple aldol reaction by recognizing that that's just a ketone and it's hiding. Uh, in the case of these two, this is kind of uh, topical. One of these is a covalent reactive group and one of them is not. Brendan, which one is the covalent reactive group? Uh, definitely the pyridine. This one is basically methyl vinyl ketone hiding. This one is styrene hiding. Easy, right? This is intuitive stuff. So we don't need to spend too much time on it. Um, and in these last, I'm gonna skip problem to number five. You can check that out in the YouTube video. And in the case of the final example shown here, we kind of already covered this when we covered chlorophyll. Uh, remember that because of the ability of these things to form quinomethides, it's easy for these types of groups to add in. And in fact, just um, for completion's sake, let's just mention that this famous intermediate here is known as a gramine. And gramines are really good at being displaced because again, this quinomethide-like thing that we saw in lecture number two. So uh, I'm a, sort of ending one minute late, sorry to go over time, but I, I'm really enjoying the Zoom format because I can skip to the end. You can look at that final 15 minutes on the 2019 lecture, but we did, a, I think, a much better job this year than two years ago in going really, really slowly through halogen dance and lithiation chemistry, which can be very confusing. And so hopefully less of you are confused in 2021 than were confused in 2019. Um, so with that, uh, we'll see you for the next installment where we finally cover how to make heterocycles. That's coming up on Wednesday. Stay tuned. Thanks, everyone.